So what is this Capital Markets Union? Well, it is part of a wide set of initiatives from the European Commission uh, aimed at creating jobs and growth in Europe. So you have a number of projects such as Europe 2020, Connecting Europe, Innovation Union, the 2030 Climate and Energy Package, etc. Uh, that have identified a number of priorities uh, in order to achieve this objective. And in March 2013, the European Commission has published a preliminary report on the long-term financing of the economy that complements these initiatives and is focused on how these initiatives are to be financed, whether it's by banks or by capital markets, crowdfunding, whether it's public investments or private investments, etc. And a large number of these, the proposals in the long-term financing initiative have now been rebranded Capital Markets Union. So, well, the main idea behind the Capital Markets Union is to increase the non-bank financing of the real economy with a bigger role for capital markets and investors such as pension funds and insurers. And the idea is to increase and diversify the supply of funding with the hope that it will translate into jobs and growth. And this initiative is focused in particular on two areas infrastructure and SMEs. So why infrastructure and SMEs? Well, that's not exactly new thinking. Infrastructure investing has always been seen as the holy grail of economic stimulus if we look at the post-World War II programs. So when you want to create growth, you, you invest in, uh, in infrastructure. It's, uh, it's fairly standard thinking. And why SMEs? Well, uh, because there has been the realization that SMEs are the biggest employers in Europe. So again, the idea uh, is that by helping SMEs, uh, we would create jobs and growth. Mm -hmm. So five early priorities have been identified uh, for action. The first uh, priority is to simplify the information that companies are requested to publish to investors before raising money in capital markets as the information required can be very burdensome and it can be very costly for companies especially small companies to to, to sure. gather this information the objective is to simplify the information uh, required to make it easier and cheaper for companies to access capital markets all right the second priority is to develop standardized methodologies and grades to assess the credit worthiness of SMEs. And the objective is to make it easier for non-expert lenders and investors to get the information that they need to lend to SMEs. Because SMEs are a very diverse set of entities. I mean, when you speak about SMEs from one member state to the next, it covers very different types of companies, very different sizes, very different definitions. So it's very heterogeneous and that makes it difficult for investors who uh, don't have a local presence to be able to compare and to truly assess the risk of these companies. Mm -hmm. Then the third priority and the most important one is uh, the revival of securitization but this time only uh, good quality securitization. So as a reminder for uh, those who are not familiar with this topic uh, securitization is the practice of pulling together and repackaging a number of loans granted by a bank and to issue tradable debt securities such as bonds sold to investors and the investors who buy these securities will be repaid uh, as the underlying loans are reimbursed the, this technique was at the heart of the financial crisis if you remember because it is what enabled banks to transform uh, very risky subprime loans into AAA rated securities. But now the Commission wants to uh, define through a number of criteria a good securitization that would be safer, simple and transparent. And the intention is that this good securitization could then benefit from a much softer uh, regulatory treatment to make it more attractive to in for investors to buy it again. So what means a much softer regulatory treatment? Well, that means that investors would need to have less capital to absorb potential losses. So, and the last two uh, priorities 
are the creation of a new type of fund uh, dedicated to investing in long-term assets and harmonizing the legal framework of private placements. Private placements is when a company raises funds directly from a small group of investors rather than on a stock exchange. And the objective here again is to harmonize the legal framework to remove the national differences in order to make it easier for foreign investors to, uh, to access these financing channels. Okay. So those are the main, well, the five uh, key priorities that constitute what is the Capital Markets Union. Yeah. Now, why the need for this Capital Markets Union? I mean, why, uh, why did the Commission uh, start with this initiative? Uh, what was the thinking behind it? Well, uh, this initiative is based on a number of uh, assumptions, some of which we find debatable, and it is very important to understand them. The first assumption is that the lack of growth and job creation comes from a lack of credit supply, and therefore we need to boost the supply of credit and capital markets. Well, in fact, we know that the lack of growth comes from a large part uh, from a lack of aggregate consumer demand, itself linked to structural factors that have been here for decades, such as the rise of inequalities over the past decade. I mean, famous economists such as uh, Stiglitz or Piketty have abundantly written on this. And what happened is that the low and middle classes have seen their purchasing power uh, decline steadily over the past decades. And as they had access to uh, cheap credit, they managed to continue to consume as much as before. Mm -hmm. And it is hoped that by increasing the supply of credit, they will borrow more and consume more, which in turn uh, will lead to companies uh, borrowing more and hiring to produce more. Now, the issue with that thinking is that European households are already heavily indebted and are very worried about the future. And therefore, it is doubtful that more credit will translate into more consumption and more growth. And yet, the political response is focused on supplying more cheap credit to the economy and completely ignores the demand side aspect of the issue. And it has been argued that alternatively, a more progressive tax system uh, favoring uh, income over wealth and inheritance would truly increase the purchasing power of the low and middle class and translate into uh, a consumption boost and more growth. We also note a strong desire uh, to transform the European uh, funding model towards a US model where mm -hmm. capital markets play a bigger role. And this is also very interesting because it has been amply demonstrated that the structure of a financial system, whether it is bank based or capital market based is secondary from a gross perspective. It is really, it does not make a meaningful difference. And so in this respect, the argument that uh, the US has a higher uh, growth rate than Europe because it's more uh, financed by capital market is a very weak and debatable argument. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, there's been this widespread narrative that uh, banks caused the crisis and therefore banks are too risky and we need to have less banks and more capital markets. But in fact, if we look in detail at what happened during the crisis, this is not true. The crisis was not a banking crisis, it was a shadow banking crisis, as the first entities that were in trouble in 2007 were the shadow banking entities of large investment banks. And again, if we distinguish by bank business models, the crisis showed that some investment banking activities were too risky and had to be bailed out, whereas traditional banks proved much more robust and much more focused on lending to the real economy. And yet, by promoting a revival of securitization, the European Commission is implicitly promoting uh, the investment banking model that required a bailout, as investment banks are heavily involved in the securitization process. And this is contrary to the lessons of the crisis that are that instead we should promote uh, traditional uh, retail funded banks. As a side note, uh, we hear uh, very often again that some traditional banks uh, failed as well, so they're also not very robust. And we hear again, you know, very frequently the example of the Spanish savings banks and Northern Rock, etc. Well, 
these banks failed, but interestingly enough, these banks were not pure traditional banks. I mean, these banks were not retail funded. They relied a lot on wholesale funding, and some of these banks engaged in securitization. So if anything, it confirms that banks engaged in these activities proved more fragile compared to the pure traditional retail funded banking model. What is interesting also is that this narrative may give the misleading impression that banks and capital market financing are two independent things, whereas in reality they are closely intertwined, as investment banks perform a large part of the activities in capital markets. And one last point that we find worth uh, highlighting is that contrary to the narrative, uh, the capital markets union is anything but a new idea. It is not new thinking. In fact, it is exactly pursuing what was happening pre-crisis, where securitization and market-based market banking was growing. Um, a third claim that we challenge as well is the idea that bank lending has to decline uh, as a result of new post-crisis regulation. I mean, as we have seen over the past years, uh, European banks have increased their capital and are in the process of cleaning their balance sheet. And they can therefore now lend more and not less. I mean, better capitalized banks are able to lend more. It's as simple as that. Now, in reality, we know that some banks, some banks may choose to allocate their capital to uh, more profitable activities. But if anything, it raises the case to separate universal banks to refocus them on their core mission. Uh, another claim uh, that also is strongly debatable in our view is the idea that uh, reviving securitization uh, will increase uh, the supply of credit to SMEs. I mean, contrary to this narrative, uh, we strongly believe that the revival of securitization is not about increasing the supply of credit to SMEs. I mean, it is already acknowledged by a number of stakeholders that SME loan securitization will be too complex to work due to the differences in national bankruptcy laws and in the definitions of what is an SME. It is also acknowledged that SME loan securitization will also be too expensive to work without subsidies due to the need to remunerate a number of intermediaries and to offer an attractive return to investors. And this questions the idea that it can be a sustainable financing alternative for SMEs. Another point that uh, we need to uh, keep in mind is the fact that assessing the risk and the credit worthiness of an SME requires not only reading its financial statements, but also crucially knowing the local economic context and competition and meeting its management. And a bank with a local presence will be able to get this information, whereas a faraway investors will not. And now the issue is that these qualitative elements cannot be adequately captured in a grade such as the rating. And therefore, again, it questions the idea that investors would be able to perform the necessary due diligence to lend on a sustainable basis to SMEs. So while mentioning SMEs makes for a compelling narrative, in our view, the revival of securitization is not about increasing financing for SMEs, but rather about increasing the profitability and competitiveness of the EU financial industry. And in fact, we recently uh, went to Italy and we spoke to a number of SMEs there. And Italy is a very good example because it's typically one of the countries where SMEs have, have been affected by the crisis and are struggling to get some credit. And when talking to these Italian SMEs, they clearly said that securitization will not work for them and that they would prefer instead more traditional banking. Additionally, uh, and most importantly, and that's, very, that's a very important point. I mean, if there's one thing uh, you, I want you to remember today, it's, it's this one. When we hear about the need to increase the availability of credit, we only talk in terms of quantity of credit and not in terms of quality. And yet, one lesson from the crisis is that access to funding is not an issue in normal times, but only in times of stress. And therefore, what is needed is not just more credit in general, but more stable credit that does not withdraw quickly in times of stress. And in this respect, increasing the reliance of the economy on capital market financing uh, 
is a double-edged sword. I mean, while it might increase the supply of credit in good times, capital market financing is more procyclical than traditional bank lending, being highly dependent on investors' greed and fear, which means uh, to caricature that it can flood the market with credit when it is optimistic and withdraw, withdraw credit very quickly in times of stress. And this is not the kind of stable financing that SMEs need to grow. Am I, am, I, am, I, am I wrong? This is a new drawing of, of yours. Yeah, it was just meant to illustrate the fact that uh, capital market financing is what we call, in a lot of cases, hot money that floods and then it's like a tide. You know, it floods and then it withdraws quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we need. We need stable credit in line with the original idea of long-term financing, which in fact is slightly different from the uh, early priorities that are being put forward by the European Commission. Another claim that we find uh, debatable and even dangerous is this whole idea that retail savings that are currently uh, in bank deposits should be unlocked and pushed uh, to a more productive use in capital markets. Well, first, Retail deposits do finance the real economy as they contribute to the stable funding of banks. And therefore, I mean, if we reduce bank deposits, it means that banks will have to finance themselves uh, through wholesale funding, which, as we have seen during the crisis, is a very unstable and short term form of funding, which, in fact, was a, one of the major causes of the crisis. Another issue with pushing uh, retail savings towards capital market is that it is likely that it will increase the risk of mis-selling. And last but not least, uh, the, the, the whole narrative these days is that we have, done in terms, we have done enough in terms of regulation, mission accomplished, and now we should focus only on growth and jobs. Well, again, this is an incorrect and um, dangerous narrative. While it is true that much regulation has been put in place after the crisis, most of it is focused on making individual institutions more robust, but very little has been done to make the financial system as a whole more robust and stable. And this is indeed very different. Making the system more robust requires, for example, ensuring that financial institutions do not run into trouble at the same time. If one medium-sized bank uh, runs into trouble and, and goes into bankruptcy, well, that is not a threat to the system because another bank can buy the trouble bank and ensure a continuity of services. If, however, most banks experience trouble simultaneously, as happened during the crisis, then governments need to intervene and bail them out with taxpayers' money. And as long as this is not addressed, we have not reduced the risk of future crises which is a pre-requirement for sustainable growth. And over the last year, the political momentum has shifted dramatically, and we have gone from we need to regulate shadow banking to we need to promote shadow banking. Well, again, without uh, much needed additional macro prudential regulation, we fear that we will not have the foundations for sustainable growth and job creation. Now, why should I care as a citizen and a taxpayer? Well, uh, as discussed, uh, first by focusing only on the supply side and not addressing the lack of demand, we fear that the capital markets union uh, is unlikely to create meaningful jobs and growth. Secondly, and most importantly, uh, the capital markets union could make our financial system more short term more fragile and increase the risk of domino effects. Non-bank lending involved a chain of entities performing different functions and linked by a web of contracts, whereas in contrast, bank lending is conducted under one roof. Well, this web of contracts between the entities means that if one entity fails, it is likely to impact the others with the kind of domino dynamic that we have seen. And the same goes uh, for uh, the collateral, I mean, non-bank lending is a more collateral intensive activity, which is that most lending transactions between financial institutions are very short term and are guaranteed by financial securities. 
As an example, you have bank A who lends 10 million euros to fund B over one week and give as a guarantee 10 million worth of Belgacom shares. And then the fund B uses the same Belgacom shares as a guarantee to obtain funding from bank C, etc. While the chain created by the same securities that are being lent several times also creates another web of contracts that increases the risk of domino effects in our financial system. Thirdly, uh, transferring risk from banks to pension funds, as is currently uh, being promoted, might also increase uh, moral hazard. So moral hazard uh, is when private entities uh, take the profits, but when the public pays the cost when they fail. And when we think about moral hazard, we tend to think about retail deposits and bank bailouts. And yet, if tomorrow uh, we develop private uh, pension funds in all member states, as is uh, the plan, and one large pension fund runs into trouble, it is quite likely that there will be a political willingness to bail it out with taxpayers' money, which would increase moral hazard. So that's something we need to watch out. And lastly, the agenda uh, of the Commission on Infrastructure Pr Financing promotes the development of public-private partnerships. So what are public-private partnerships? They are long-term contracts uh, between a public sector entity and a private sector entity, where the private firm builds and operates an asset such as a highway, a railway, or any other infrastructure, and is paid uh, either by an annual rent from the public entity or through user fees, such as toll roads. And the idea behind that is that there is a lack of investment in infrastructure in Europe, governments have no money for public investments, and therefore we need to increase the involvement of private capital through these public-private partnerships. Mm. Now, this privatization of quasi-public goods such as infrastructure raises a number of concerns. It is very attractive to politicians as it can enable them to uh, show lower deficit figures because instead of showing the full cost of an investment, say 1 billion to build a bridge, uh, the public accounting in many cases will only show the annual rent that the public entity is paying, say, I don't know, 80 million per year. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue is that these public-private partnerships shift the cost of investments to future generations and have historically a poor track record in terms of value for money for taxpayers, with citizens ending up paying more for the investment in most cases and rent-seeking situations. And the last issue is that privatizing infrastructure might exclude citizens who cannot afford it from using these infrastructures. So, what are Finance Watch recommendations? Well, first, uh, the definition of good securitization that is being proposed by the Commission goes in the right direction, but is not strict enough and needs to be tighter to make securitization truly simple and sustainable and to restore investors' confidence. Two features are particularly problematic in our view. I will not go into too much detail here because it's a separate topic and it's, it can be fairly technical, but mm -hmm. as Mathieu said, we have a, a report on our website for those of you who are interested. But very briefly, the, 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 main two, the two main concerns that we have are the fact that the definition, once again, includes references to external ratings. Uh, that is an issue because, again, it could uh, disincentivize investors' uh, due diligence as they rely instead on the ratings and it would reduce the diversity of opinion. And instead, it is likely to attract, once again, uh, non-expert buyers buying products that they do not understand and therefore more prone to selling quickly in times of stress. The inclusion of a hard rating threshold could also create, once again, cliff effects, meaning that when a securitization has a rating downgrade below a certain level, the investors whose mandate forbids them to hold assets uh, who, who are below a certain rating may be forced to all sell at the same time. The other issue uh, that we have with the definition is that it allows tranching. Uh, 
what is tranching? Tranching is the practice of issuing against the pool of loans several types of securities with different seniorities. So you have first an equity tranche that will absorb losses on the whole uh, pool of loans, then a mezzanine tranche up to senior tranches. Well, it is recognized, and that's, I mean, there's compelling evidence from academics, but also from the IMF, from uh, ex-practitioners, etc., that tranching creates enormous additional complexity by manufacturing risk that are very hard to assess. As an example, uh, buying the senior AAA tranches is not risk-free, but would be equivalent to selling insurance against hurricanes where you earn a little premium all of the time, but you're exposed infrequently to very high losses. And in fact, it is even more risky because the risk is correlated, which would be similar to an insurer uh, faced with hurricanes happening the same months in every country where he has sold insurance policies. This is one of the most complex type of risk to assess for an investor. It has also been recognized that tranching creates model uncertainty which means that even the bank's mathematical models are unable to assess with certainty the risk of certain tranches due to the enormous complexity. And tranching also creates conflicts of interest between the holders of different tranches. For example, if you have in your pool a delinquent mortgage where the borrower is unable to repay, the holder of the junior or equity tranche will be inclined to renegotiate the loan with the borrower to increase the chance that he will be repaid in the end, just as a bank would. Now, in contrast, the holder of the senior AAA tranche will push for foreclosure, as we have seen during the crisis, to limit the loss and ensure that he will not be affected. So those are just a few examples of the issues linked with tranching. And for all these reasons, we believe that in order for qualifying securitization to be truly simple, it should not include tranching. That is not to say that tranching should be banned, but merely to say that the additional level of complexity that it creates does not justify a significant softening of its prudential treatment. The second recommendation uh, that we have is that we need to put in place new macroprudential regulation to reduce the risk of domino effects. And we know what to do. I mean, the, the, the specific measures have already been proposed by institutions such as the Financial Stability Board. So it's not a case of, oh, we don't know how to address this risk. In fact, we know. Uh, as an example, we know that we need to limit the number of time a, a, a financial security, such as a share, can be lent between institutions. Uh, we know also that we need to introduce minimum haircuts on this transaction, etc. So it's really not a question of not knowing what to do, it's a question of political will. And it's very important because as we are promoting uh, non-bank lending that on one hand will increase the risk of domino effects, we need crucially on the other hand to mitigate this risk. Otherwise, it is very likely that we are creating a much more short-term and fragile financial system that is inconsistent with the objective of sustainable uh, growth and job creation. The third recommendation that we have is that uh, we should promote the traditional banking model. I mean, the current regulation unfairly favors very large banks over small traditional banks. Uh, amongst other measures, we need to redesign the liquidity ratios uh, in bank prudential regulation that currently push banks to invest in securities instead of uh, lending. And we also need to remove the advantage of internal models used by very large banks over standardized models used by small banks in the calculation of their risk. Mm -hmm. And lastly, uh, regarding the public-private partnerships, we believe that, at the very least, we should have complete transparency on these contracts and periodic reviews of their value for money by uh, parliaments in order to address uh, the, their opacity and the lack of democratic accountability. So that is uh, all for today. Thank you very much. Thanks. And Thanks we will now time. try to answer any questions from the audience. Yes, great. So. Uh but you are, of course, 
uh, welcome to send us all your questions on the dashboard. It's pretty easy. You can send that to us and then I will dispatch to, um, to Fred. Several has uh, already come. Um, a first one that I've got, I'd like to ask you, is that, do you know, you know, we're talking about supply and demand. Hmm? Why do you think that the focus is so much on the supply, uh, on the supply side? Why, what is going on in the mindset that makes that in the analysis of the problem, the focus is on the supply? Uh, it's a combination of reason, but I'd say it's traditional uh, economic thinking that uh, you know, shooting the economy uh, with uh, cheap credit at the risk of creating new bubbles is effective uh, to, 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 boost, uh, to boost consumption. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, it, it worked for, for, an, for some time, but we are now in a very extreme situation, I mean, with interest rates close to zero. So I think between these uh, extreme monetary uh, conditions that are very lax, and also the fact that households are already indebted and worried about the future, we've reached the end of this model and uh, also uh, addressing the, the demand side would entail uh, a different repartition would entail i mean it's it's a political decision and i'm not sure there is the political momentum to to address that but again it's not there's no one single reason it's a number of reasons yes, sure. a question from uh, julia um, isn't diversification of funding a good thing so we don't put all the eggs in the same bucket? That's a very good question. Um, well, in theory, yes, it's a good thing. I mean, you, you think, you know, it's more diversified then it means it's more robust, etc. But in reality, uh, there are two caveats to this reasoning. First of all, uh, diversification works mostly in normal times. We know from past experience that in times of crisis, all everything gets highly correlated and the diversification benefits basically exist except when you need them. And secondly, when we talk about diversification, it's not, again, it's not about increasing the number of channels. What we need is stable channels, sustainable channels. So it's, again, you know, it's a, we're talking a qu quantity over quality here. And, and we should really focus on the channels that provide the kind of stable, acyclical funding that is there to stay where typically the lenders are here to support their, their borrowers even in tough times because they have done the due diligence and they trust that the borrower has a sound model and will be able to repay in the end. That's what we need. That's what is long-term financing about the real, with the, uh, the real economy. Okay. Yes, great. Um, then we get other question coming in. Uh, another one from Eric. Um, do all SMEs across Europe face the same problem when they look for funding? Uh, won't free flow of capital across borders uh, help them? Uh, another very good question. Uh, well, first of all, when we look at the ECB data, we find that uh, the lack of access to funding for SMEs is very different uh, between countries. And in fact, uh, there is no problem uh, in Northern Europe uh, there, is pro there are some problems, however, in uh, southern Europe, in countries such as Spain, Italy, Greece and Portugal. So when you look at that, you see that it's an issue of geographical fragmentation rather than an overall uh, shortage of credit supply, which could entail different policies, which could entail, for example, uh, strengthening national uh, banks in, in southern countries, as would be the case through a strong banking union. Mm -hmm. And to answer the second part of the question, increasing the cross-border flow of lending and collateral is, uh, is a strongly debatable solution because, again, it's not a new idea. In fact, that's exactly what we've done uh, since the collateral directive of 2002. And, and we have seen what happened during the sovereign crisis. We've seen that, yes, in good times, the, the flow of cross-border investment uh, in sovereign debt increased. And that led to uh, increased supply of funding for governments, a convergence of the uh, borrowing rates. But then, uh, when the crisis hit, investors differentiated very quickly between uh, the sovereign debt of troubled member states and the sovereign debt of uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. And that led to a drastic fragmentation, with some country almost overnight seeing the cost of their funding double or triple. And the same here. I mean, if you look at Securitization. Let's take the example of SME securitization. Well, we are not able and we will not be able for uh, the years to come 
to create pan-European pools of SME loans due to the national differences. So what that means is that the SME securitization will be based on national pools. So investors will buy securitization of Italian SME loans and securitization of German SME loans. And so you might wonder you know, whether once again, uh, in times of stress, they will not differentiate very quickly between uh, securitization of troubled countries and securitization of German SMEs. So the, this whole idea about harmonization and improving the cross-border flow of lending and collateral is not necessarily as stable uh, as would be desirable mm -hmm. in our view. All right. Question now from Yen. Um, like other major financial reform programs, such as uh, FSAP, what is to prevent um, it from being dominated and directed by industry and commission technical working groups? I mean, the commission is, uh, is, has launched two consultations to gather the views of the different stakeholders. So it's a fairly open process and we strongly hope uh, that the response from civil society organizations will be taken into account. Um, the, you know, that's all we can say at this stage. We are very early in, in, the, in the process. What, what we fear mostly is that, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a contextual thing. I mean, history repeats itself and we know that when we are in recession, you know, difficult economic times, politicians have a tendency to buy any argument uh, if it promises uh, short-term growth and jobs. And we should resist this, you know, this tendency to, to, to focus, to be short-sighted and focus on the short terms, otherwise we might uh, see the seeds of the next crisis. Mm -hmm. All right. Got a question from uh, Iwo. Uh, does does a CMU support merging of the stock exchanges in the EU member countries? Uh, well, I we, I don't think that the proposals are detailed enough to uh, to draw a, a firm conclusion on this at this stage. They certainly support uh, the harmonization of the rules to uh, to, to yeah to have a more uh, single single market, single framework, etc. So they go in this direction. Whether they will support specifically the mergers, to be honest, I don't know. Mm. I don't think we are able to know that. All right. Another question coming in from Aline. Uh, what is your view on the EIB providing guarantees on mezzanine trenches of SME ABS? Uh, well, there is this proposal. Uh, to, for the European Investment Bank and European Investment Funds to uh, provide guarantees for the first losses of uh, some securitizations. Uh, well, if there is a compelling case, uh, that is that some, some investments uh, are economically viable, have demonstrated uh, clearly excellent identified positive externalities, but don't find enough uh, funding. There is a case for public intervention under this criteria only. Now, in terms of what form should this intervention take, uh, we're in, well, it's, a, it's another debate. We're not convinced that the AIB should take the first loss. We believe that instead the AIB should take uh, the, the senior trenches. Why? Because this first loss uh, is the easiest risk to assess. That gives you the early warning as an investor when things start to go sour. So investors are better placed to take that risk. Whereas, as we discussed earlier, the senior AAA tranches is the most complex type of risk that you cannot mitigate. And here, the EIB would have a lot of added value to, uh, to take that kind of risk. But that's a much wider debate. Yes. All right. Uh, a question from uh, Severin. Um, is it a good idea that CMU is discussed at the EU20 level and not at the Eurozone level? That's an excellent question. I'm afraid I do not have <laughs> the answer or a strong opinion on that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, question just coming in from Katie. Um, should CMU be greater in its ambition to promote the single market in financial services, working to break down barriers? which can ultimately benefit investment firms and 
consumers? Uh, it depends what we mean by more ambitious. I mean, like, like we said, this whole idea of uh, harmonizing uh, the, and improving the cross-border flow and in increasing the single market is not bad per se, but history shows, and recent history shows that it can lead to more procyclicality, more uh, fragmentation in terms of stress, etc. So if by more ambitious, we mean making it more robust, by ensuring at the same time that you have robust private backstops, that you reduce the procyclicality and interconnectedness. Essentially, that you this uh, move towards more integration of the European market is balanced at the same time by uh, necessary macroprudential regulation, then yes. If we mean just increasing the cross-border flow of investment and collateral, I don't think it's desirable for the reasons that we mentioned earlier. All right. We are reaching almost 45 minutes now, so is there a point that you would like to stress before closing the, 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 the webinar, an idea, something that you would like really to, to conclude with? Well, if we recall the, the genesis of the Capital Markets Union, uh, it was originally the long-term financial initiative whose objective was to promote passion capital, investing in long-term illiquid assets. And that was a very uh, good uh, and very useful objective. And I fear that with the Capital Markets Union, we have somehow shifted dramatically from that original objective towards more short-term uh, oriented uh, measures. And, and we should go back to this original purpose, which is really, truly what company needs to grow. I mean, they need this kind of stable funding. And again, we also need this type of uh, long-term patient capital, provided it acts in a long-term manner, which is, does not go per se. So we should um, probably, well, in our view, uh, redesign some of the measures to towards this direction, I mean, to not completely lose the long-term focus of the original uh, proposal.